Hello, and welcome to the Marketing Times Analytics Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Safranis, and today I'm on with James Reeder. James, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, absolutely. So my name is James Reeder. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Business at the University of Kansas. I study questions regarding Salesforce deployment and effectiveness, promotions, and uh, adoption of new technology and how it impacts marketing activities. Interesting. So I guess to start off with, just how have you seen the marketing industry evolve over your career? So I have been out for my PhD now about 10 years, and I'd say there's two big trends. One has been pervasive for a while, but then one of them is, of course, more immediate. So I think the bigger trend, at least to me as a, a kind of a quantitative marketer, is the application and the use of data um, at all levels of companies to make better decision business decision making. And then I'd say the other one is, of course, more immediate, which is generative AI and the generative AI impact on how businesses are conducting their daily operations today. Yeah, it's interesting to see how businesses have started to use data as almost a a navigation for marketing decisions rather than the theories, I think, that were originally used. I think marketing used to be a lot more theory-based and use much more high-level data. And as the granularity of the data has improved, it has been able to supplement, complement the marketing process and make the decisions a lot more fine-tuned relative to what will resonate with their audiences. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think having a good grasp of your data, which gives you insight into your clients and your business processes, only makes uh, your business decisions uh, more informed and better targeted to the customers that you're going after. So how has Salesforce assisted in that transition of technology? So when I speak to Salesforce, I don't mean the actual like software. I talk more about the general concept, but I can say having a standardized um, deployment that can also then be customized to the use cases of the individual firms allows better insights for the sales agents because, of course, they need to know more about their customers, more about what should they do. It allows managers to have kind of greater insight uh, into what their sales agents are actually doing and how they're performing. And then many firms are using predictive analytics within Salesforce to develop um, where their sales strategy should be deployed more effectively. What about in the actual Salesforce that, that you're talking about outside of the technology? How has the mechanics of sales changed as marketing has evolved? So I'd say there's two big ways. One of them has been driven a lot by COVID. So prior to COVID, much of sales was done kind of face to face. I think some firms are starting to transition into an inside versus outside. Inside sales is, of course, sales within the firm where the individual sales agents then interact with their clients using some sort of remote technology. Prior to COVID, it was a lot of like over the phone um, behavior, whereas um, outside sales agents are the ones that would actually go and talk to people in person. And so different firms would have different stances on who does what. But I think now because COVID happened and you have Zoom and all the rest of those different types of technologies, there's a lot more blending between those two things where an outside sales agent may be using both in-person visits and remote technologies to integrate and be more effective with their clients. On the other hand, I think sales agents had a lot of good intuition about their clients, but having a rich set of data to aid them in better decision making is now being shown in the research to actually make better performing sales agents. And I'm curious, just to go back to your PhD, what research have you done in your career that's bringing you, that's around this area? Sure. So I have two papers that are published. So one of them is in management science with my co-authors, Bowen Lowe, Mitch Lovett, and Brett Gordon, where we look at actual political advertising and when should you go um, negative versus positive in kind of your political messaging. I then have another project with Rita Bradakar and Paul Ellickson, which is in marketing science, 
which looks at a kind of a fundamental marketing problem, which is in oftentimes in marketing studies, we extra, we think of treatments like emails as being monolithic, like you get a price promotion versus a non-price promotion. But what we try to do is separate out the key components so you can study each individual kind of component within the email subject line itself, as well as looking at different types of promotional activities using um, machine learning. I have current ongoing projects which look at the differential effects of virtual versus in-person sales visits. I have a project that is looking at extrapolating new email creatives using large language models and machine learning. And then I have some other works in progress that I'm excited about. That's very interesting. I want to go to the first one that you mentioned, political advertising. What mm -hmm. were the main takeaways from that research? So what we were looking at is in kind of the prior 2000 and 2004 presidential elections, we were trying to see when should you go positive versus when should you go negative. And based upon the local level conditions, you want to pick and choose because states have this all or nothing electoral model where it's not if you win a, an individual location, it's your sum total of all your votes within a state. And so depending upon how the local level um, is swaying one way or another, you may be more incentivized to go positive, to bring out um, more people to vote if you have an advantage, or you may want to go negative if you have not as much of an advantage because that suppresses um, people wanting to go out and vote. And so we showed is that in very close elections, your choice of going positive versus negative could actually sway the overall presidential election. Wow. And so that's at a presidential level. Would that be similar in dynamics to smaller elections as well? I don't see why it wouldn't be. It's just the general idea that positive advertising tends to float all boats, like it, it has a stimulating impact, but then people like you more. So your opponent actually gets some sort of positive spillover effects as well. So if you have a good advantage, it heightens your advantage in the vote count. Whereas uh, negative advertisement um, not only diminishes the like, how much people like your opponent, but it also suppresses the vote as well. Mm -hmm. What do you think? What's your personal prediction on this year, 2024, do you think we'll see a lot of negative advertising? I feel like by by that insight, we would want to see a lot of positive advertising to encourage more voting, right? Yeah, but in general, I think most elections have been swaying more towards having negative advertising overall. So my guess is the trend will continue. It just seems to be pervasive at the presidential level. But I could be wrong, and it'd be a really welcome change. Yeah. So what... Well, what what do you think is driving the decision to uh, do negative advertising? I'd say mostly it's probably gut instinct and polling. Like it may be more advantageous to talk negatively about your opponent's record, especially if you are if you're not the incumbent. If I'm the incumbent now, I have somebody who can look at my record and say, "Oh, I can do better than they can." So it makes kind of attack ads much easier, especially if you're the non-incumbent candidate yeah that's that's interesting i can see why somebody would want to do it but also from what you said why they wouldn't want to do it that's good to know what was your second piece of research around so we're looking at email marketing so of course oh, yeah. email marketing yeah. is like one of the biggest things drivers out there because it's so cost efficient and so what we did is we basically tried to understand all the components within an email subject line and how that drives open rates and click rates and ultimate purchasing um, because it's a really tough problem if you think about it so oftentimes if you're running like a b testing or what have you you may just say oh it's a price promotion versus a non-price promotion or it's a 30 percent discount versus a 40 percent discount so what we try to do is take a much more granular approach not only look at kind of the promotional aspects like free shipping and everything else, but also the semantic ones. Do you use an exclamation point or do you say something like this personalized or things like that? Yeah, that that's interesting. And and when you when it comes to sharing those insights, how do you take a academic research and turn it into something that is digestible by marketers? 
And that's tough. So I think what you want to do is always try to ground it in the problems that the firm is having. So I've had the opportunity to not only conduct academic research, but do some consulting stuff that then turn into further academic engagement. So that's been really nice for me. But I think the first step is always understanding what the business problem is, because academic research at, at the end of the day should not only talk about theories and constructs, but then also provide deep insights that business use, the business community or the public policy community can then um, digest and actually use. And so what I find the first kind of key step is what is the date? What is the big business problem that businesses are grappling with? Is it a cost size problem, a cost side problem? Is it one of lack of targeting or not understanding the customer or not understanding how a customer would react? And so then I try to take my research and then um, meld it with those business problems so then the stakeholders can understand, oh, if I take a certain action, this is actually the gains I will see. Um, and I think that makes things a lot easier for them to digest. When you're looking at email marketing, what are some of the KPIs that you optimize towards? So in that paper, we focused on kind of the big three, I would say. So first one is email open rates. So that's going to be the big one that I think everybody looks at. Uh, the next one we looked at is purchase incidents and then unconditional purchase amounts. So those are our three. So not just did you open it, did you actually click on the open and look at what's going on, but did you ultimately purchase based upon what was in the email and then how much were you purchasing? So given that this was from a retailer, like a clothing retailer, we could easily see not only just the open part, but then also are there subsequent activities down the purchasing funnel versus other email marketing where you're just trying to build awareness or kind of engagement. And so there you would look at things like email open rates or given maybe where the email is leading to, how much time they're spending on your, your website or how many pages are they going through and stuff like that would be other KPIs that would be worth looking at. Yeah. Do you think that in the future we'll have different metrics to measure marketing effectiveness or email as an example? That's a good question. I, I think it depends upon especially like where this whole generative AI starts adapting. So given that firms are starting to explore their own chatbots or using generative AI to make their own agents within their business ecosystem, there might be new metrics about how much time are people spending with these kind of generative chatbots or because the information may be stored, you can look at evolving sentiment analysis amongst your constituency as they interact with these kind of generative AI agents and things like that. I think that could be very useful, but I think standard kind of practice of looking at email open rates and page landings and th things like that have, I think, been shown to be good proxies for ultimate engagement and behavior of your customers. Yeah, I think journey analysis is still in its early stages. And yes. yeah, I think there, there could be a little bit more context added to what kind of a journey somebody took for your product. <laughs> Yeah, and I think uh, given that there's like pushback on tracking cookies and things like that's going to create an even bigger problem for online marketers to see the paths that you're taking not only on your website, but potentially competitors' websites and like information gathering services as well. What's your position on the future of cookie-like technology? Do you think we'll always have tracking and the privacy will improve or will it go away? I don't know. My my area is not necessarily looking at kind of tracking cookies and things like that. I think there's always going to be a tension between giving up too much information. Like I'm a very private person. Like I don't have a, a large internet presence except for my LinkedIn page and a few things like that. And so for me, I am very much opposed to things like tracking cookies, but I can see their value in that it makes things a lot more easier for you. There is no free lunch. And so you're giving up that information for free to these other companies. And then that information is being sold and everything else. Um, so I think a lot of companies are probably going to fight you know, getting rid of that because that's a nice, clean revenue source for them. Um, I think it really just matters how much do customers value their privacy against kind of the benefits that it, you gain from having these cookies, see where you're going and potentially even giving you like customized interactions with the firm, um, which I think a lot of people like the feeling that their um, experience is customized and tailored towards them. 
do you think that marketing is going to become more personalized over time or do you think there will be a negative sentiment towards hyper personalized advertising I think to a degree, it's going to just get more personalized. I I think a lot of individuals like the sense that they're getting the exact product that they've asked for. So like things like mass customization and things like that are very well seen by customers. And so I think the more you can package a customized marketing plan to a customer without it seeming like too creepy, like you're looking over their shoulder and seeing what exactly they like, I'm going to say that customers are going to to find that very beneficial. There's things like Netflix, of course, has all your personalized recommendations. And I think people like to have that kind of sense of this is exactly what I, I'm looking for. Thank you for these great recommendations. Or Spotify has their app where you can get like personalized new music recommendations or podcast recommendations, what have you, based upon all your prior history. There, I think the personalization or kind of customization of these marketing efforts is seen as more of a boon than as I would call like creepy marketing where people are, are tracking you and seeing what you're doing. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I, I I agree. I think that there will be an appreciation for the specificity or at least the relevance of the marketing that that people get in the future. Yeah, I think there's like a spectrum of it and it's going to really come down to what the person likes. I remember hearing a story from a couple of years ago that I think it was like Amazon was looking at actually having customized products delivered to you like 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 almost like a subscription box and you could pick and choose what you wanted out of that and then return the box and kind of pay for it on the spot as a way of breaking into this kind of like daily or weekly product use rather than you going to like a convenience store or something like that i think if i saw like an amazon package that i didn't order just show up on my doorstep that had a bunch of goods that i was actually thinking about buying i might be a little bit nervous at that point personally yeah A lot of things are hard for us to fathom in our current state of really like free choice. We have a lot of freedom with regard to which products we choose. And it's not a very comfortable feeling to have that choice taken away. And I think that's a lot of the reason why the voice-based purchasing hasn't really been adopted. Because I don't want to just tell my Alexa to buy a certain product without seeing which product it is of the different offerings. I I don't think that trust level is there yet with recommendation tools. I agree. And I think to your point, I've seen articles where there's a revolution or a revitalization in retail space because individuals want to go and see and engage with the stuff that they're buying as well. I think there's like a like a reversal of buying everything online, especially because everybody was locked down for COVID for an extended period of time. I think people now want to go out and actually experience things that they're buying before they actually buy them. And so I think to your point, not only am I a little leery about having Alexa order things from me without me knowing exactly what I'm ordering, I think there's an increased attention depending on the space of actually engaging with the products that you want to buy as well. Yeah, that I was speaking earlier on a podcast about this topic, about how basically the general populace operates similarly to how individuals operate in the sense that we as a group have a tendency to sh- shift our behavior similarly, especially in reaction to economic climates and different forces that prevail across everybody. So one the example earlier was that as a populace, we tend to get really excited about technology and there's this hype cycle. And then there's the general cycle that all the technology goes through. And the point is that even as a group, we'll adopt something and then realize, oh, you know what? This doesn't have as much value as I thought and then move in another direction. Or will society will make a move towards online retail and then collectively decide, you know what, I don't love this. I do still want to go into a store. And then we'll see large shifts, large trends in people going back to stores, almost like the group acts as a single body. And agree with this kind of, I guess it's not, I guess it's just more of an observation that that people do have similar tendencies 
Is that something that you've found as well? Yeah, I think if, if there wasn't some sort of like average behavior in people based upon demographic, psychographic, behavioral characteristics, I don't think we could really do marketing. If, if everybody was so completely different than everybody else, it'd be really hard to do any sort of marketing at all. Like I, I do, I, I taught marketing analytics for a number of years at Purdue and I teach customer relationship management here at uh, University of Kansas. And I always have students go, We'll go through an example about their age profile and someone will say, well, that's not me. And it's, that's true. We can't predict an individual's behavior yet, but we can predict the average movements of people. And if we couldn't predict the average movements of people, then a marketer's job would be even more exceptionally hard than it is today. Yeah. Because for all this kind of sophistication of the models that we have, at the end of the day, we're trying to predict average trends, like average price elasticity, average response to an ad, average response to an email, average response to what have you. Now we're getting a little bit better with kind of heterogeneity, basically assuming that different groups of people react differently. But to target like an individual person's response is still incredibly hard. Yeah, it makes me think about one of the targeting models that I've seen in my career for targeting individuals with physical mail. And mm -hmm. that model had a lot of geographic variables in it, at least the first pass did. And we had some questions from the business side of why are we targeting on a geographic basis? Why aren't we using all of the behavioral data that we have, which surely is more correlated with buying behavior than just a geography, like where somebody is. And, and I think that in itself showcases that there's still a lot of value that we haven't tapped into. There's still a lot of predictive value that we don't have in our behavioral models, which is why the geographic variables are winning. Because perhaps people are clustering in with people that are similar to them. And perhaps the model is picking up, up on that. And there could be behaviors that we could collect that would be similarly predictive to that geography, but w it's a blind spot. And that's why the model is, the model is just going to pick whatever's more predictive. It's unbiased in that sense. Yeah, um, just to your point, I, I think you're absolutely right that there is often proxies for things that we want to study, right? I, I, like I tell my students, you can't have a, a gift of all the data that you want and in the way that you want it. And you always have to make compromises and trade-offs. And so if there is certain kind of behaviors that could then be brought up in like the culture of what the person's grown up on or kind of the culture that they're immersed in, then likely that's going to be geographic because that's where you live. That's where you interact. That's who you're interacting with. And so geography could often be a strong predictor of behavior just because of cultural items that are you know tied to where you live. I can give you an example. We're working on this paper where we're looking at kind of the effectiveness of in-person versus using remote technologies in Salesforce. So I'm a sales agent. Am I going to go talk to you in person or am I going to use video conferencing to engage with you? And one of the things that we find is in regions with very high broadband penetration. So basically, the idea is you have greater access to technology and use technology more on, on a more frequent basis. The gap between these two things is, is much smaller than in regions where there's not a lot of broadband access because, as we argue, people just aren't using technology very much. And so if I'm an agent that's now trying to engage with you via technology, you just don't like it because that's not what you're used to. Yeah, it's interesting to think about the information you can gather and from potential prospects, e even like with indirect indicators. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's, that's interesting to think about. And I, I've, I've heard that's how a lot of uh, hedge funds work as well. They use all sorts of different kinds of data to indicate certain consumer behaviors and habits and draw that to predictions. Yeah, I, I can't remember exactly the, the name of the paper of the authors. I, I feel really bad about it, but it was a really neat idea. So in finance, they've been using, there's data that's available where it's satellite imagery where you can look at parking lots. So you can see how many cars are in a parking lot, and they're using that to pre-forecast earnings and things like that, which I think your point is using 
indirect data that then becomes a direct proxy of the things that you're looking for, which is demand estimation and how are people interacting with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm curious about how you see marketing evolving in the coming decades, even as far as 50 years from now. How do you see marketing changing? So I think the, the, the core foundation isn't going to move at all. I think understanding the customer, understanding their wants, needs, and desires, and then being able to craft something that nudges yourself a little bit closer to that base that is profitable to you, I think that kind of core belief of marketing is ever-present. I don't think that'll ever move. I think the bigger things are what are the overall aggregate trends and what people think is useful or, or novel or important to them. For example, we have the rise of eco-friendly products because we as a society have, have decided that's important to us. And so that is becoming a greater focus of kind of what the, what the market wants to put forth. I only see that probably increasing as time goes on because people care more about not just where they live, but the overall the overall kind of nature of where they live and thinking about the future as well. Then you have things like what's going to happen now because of generative AI? Is that going to lead us down a path where we can have fully customized movies or songs or whatever that we can just come up with? Um, we're going to have greater personalization with brands is probably something I would say is going to happen. So if you think about how things have evolved between how a customer interacts with a brand, we've gone from take the 80s, where basically you saw a commercial for the brand. And then as social media came around, now you can actually quote unquote, interact with the brand by using either kind of Facebook or before that MySpace, or now we have Instagram or TikTok, where you have representatives of the brand um, interacting with their customer base. And then if you think one step further, you get to like generative AI, where now you'll have these chat bots that will interact with the you on behalf of the company that are now kind of programmed with the mentality or the culture of the company um, to help out with problems. And so it'll probably just be new technologies that allow greater connection between the company itself and the their customer base. That makes sense. Yeah, the fundamentals won't change, but the technology will evolve to be just better at what we're better at marketing. Just it's just everything is going to continue to advance and I guess that leads me to what are some of the you you touched on a couple of them, but what are some of the areas that marketing has to evolve in? So it, I think being a little bit more sensitive to the movements of their customers, which is a really hard target, where is the customer going to go move next? That's a, a big meta problem that I, I all marketers face. I think understanding along with that, like understanding exactly what they're looking for, I think is a critical aspect of marketing because oftentimes a marketer especially for very successful companies that aren't looking to the market and trying to doing their prospective marketing research may actually miss out on trends that are really important to them. And so I think a, a company that can even be wildly successful, but be humble enough to know that we don't know what's coming down the road is going to become very important as well. That's a blind spot that I think a lot of companies have, especially the most successful ones, because they are doing things so well and trying to spend more money to stay ahead of the curve is very important and very critical for your long-term viability, but they may not think that it's that important in the moment. But now that customer preferences can change very quickly, especially with things like social media, staying aware and having a pulse for what are your customers saying is very important. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. What about in sales? Do you think it's a similar set of needs in terms of the future progression of how sales operates? So I think one, so I study B2B sales. So I have to say this through the lens of like business to business rather than business to consumer, but a lot of business to business buyers are becoming more, I'd say savvy. And so it's less about trying to sell to them up front, but more about giving them the knowledge they have so that when you come to the table with them, you can have a more informed discussion about what's going on. So having a good web presence as a B2B company, allowing them to know what's going on in there and how you may help them. So then the sales agent can do a much more refined, customized, targeted sale is a big thing that I see in business to business sales. And along with that, I think it's being able to get greater information about your customer so that 
you know how to pitch to them more efficiently than just a standard boilerplate thing that you go in there and give to them. And I think a lot of that is being guided by doing predictive analytics and studying your past sales behaviors and then being able to use that information to leverage in the future as long as the market doesn't shift too much. And I think that also helps sales managers because if best practices by studying these behaviors of the past, then you can have a more efficient sales team. Whereas before you'd have maybe one really all-star sales team or salesperson, and then have a couple of pretty good people. And then you have some other ones in the lower tail. Now you can start adapting and learning from those good sales agents by studying kind of the data of their interactions and behaviors with clients, and then being able to use that information to disseminate across the rest of your sales team to make everybody better. More interconnectedness. Yes. Do you do any research with AI? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing, I think, if you ask any academic, they're going to say yes right now, because I think we're all doing it right now, because it's such a big, open question. What are, you, what are you thinking about? Right now, I, so I'm not looking at AI so much for how does it help customers or how does it help clients. My focus on AI is more looking at the academic community and how can we use certain things to do our academic job or understand phenomenon better so then we can do more deeper analysis with, you know, using these neat tools that are now at our disposal. And so my current research has been more looking at how can we use AI, either large language models or these kind of machine learning models to improve engineering of key variables or key constructs that were otherwise very difficult for academic researchers to wrap their arms around. So now we can do some more interesting things than we could before. What are some of the AI implementations in education that you've thought of? So I actually ran a a kind of a pilot thing um, this fall. So I saw some interesting work over the summer. I went to a a nice generative AI conference uh, put on by Wharton. And one of the papers that was presented there was looking at, can we use generative AI to basically act as synthetic people? So if you believe that large language models has this information behind them about how people act, and so if you've ever played around with ChatGPT, you can ask it questions and it'll respond like a person. So can we actually use generative AI to be in the role of a person that you would otherwise talk to for like marketing research purposes? And so I thought that was a really neat idea. So I had my students do it. So I taught them how to code in R. I taught them how to interact with an API. And so what I had my students do is go actually out and find companies, either local companies, family businesses, clubs on campus, what have you. And do a high level survey of just a couple people that interact with the business or the club, as well as the owner or higher ups in there. And then we use that information to seed ChatGPT to then pretend to be people that would interact with that company. And so we had, we did virtual focus groups where they had ChatGPT prime to behave like a particular customer type and then ask them about different customer relationship management interventions. What if I drop my price or what if I offer some sort of rebate or loyalty program? How would you respond to that? As well as doing kind of survey-based stuff, how to, basically generating synthetic data where ChatGPT is going to respond to a series of questions behaving as certain individuals. Um, so it was a really cool project. I, I thought it was really cool. The students seemed to think it was really interesting because they got to use technology that they're using to do help with improve their language skills and things like that, how to write better for actually something completely different than what they've been using ChatGPT for. That's great. That's great that you're ahead of the game and jumping right on this latest technology. It's fun. I, I think using the, the new tools especially things like ChatGPT and whatnot, it's not a flaw, a, a system, it's, it's a system with flaws in it. It hallucinates, it makes things up. And so I think giving students an exposure to when it works well, what are the use cases of when it works well, what are the use cases where it's not gonna work so well, I think just makes them better, more informed people when it comes to using these tools and techniques that are going to be part of their job in the near future. Yeah, it, it definitely will be a big part of our jobs. Yeah, I think there's, at least from what I've seen from the people that are really delving deep, deep into this, I think thinking of ChatGPT more as like a co-pilot, in fact, Microsoft calls theirs co-pilot, right? As a guide, more than a way of offsetting thinking, I think is the way to go. 
to me, using ChatGPT or, or whatever comes next down the pipe to basically do your thinking for you, I think is a recipe for disaster. Because if you don't have a good knowledge of what's going on, then things fall apart very quickly. If I, let's say I don't know nothing about coding and I have to do some sort of coding assignment and I say, ChatGPT, write this code for me, I'm not going to know if it's doing it right or wrong because it doesn't know if it's doing it right or wrong. It's just predicting the next word in a sequence. But let's say I have some knowledge of coding and I want to go to the next level. Now that I have some basis, I can vet the code a little bit, see what's going on and actually learn and improve from it. Yeah, it's quite limited. And I, I was talking to um, someone on, on another podcast episode about how machine learning is a more broad uh, application and is much l- more foundational than LLMs. Like LLMs are the consumer side that's gotten a lot of visibility, but machine learning is much more applicable, especially for business processes. And it's just like a more, it's almost like more specific and reliable just in the way that it's, the ways that it's implemented rather than LLMs, which is almost like the trying to be the solution for everything. And I think maybe that is what evolves into AGI, but there's also a lot of machine learning applications that don't use LLMs. Yeah, I use machine learning pretty much all the time in my research. And I think one of the interesting things, my training, so my PhD is in marketing, but I got my PhD from the University of Rochester. So really, I'm an economist that just does marketing things because we do a lot of we do a lot of like economics and micro and game theory and things like that in the Rochester PhD program. And to me, one of the things that I think is very encouraging is that a lot of businesses are now actually pivoting a little bit away from just pure machine learning, which is I'm going to predict what's going to happen to something that's called causal inference, which is I now want to understand why did it happen. And so as an academic researcher where we care so much about why rather than just what happened, I think that's a really cool thing to see the industry starting to embrace what we've been doing for years now in the academic um, side of things. And how does causal inference work practically for a business? So I think the easiest one is if you've ever done an A-B test. So I have one concept, so I very simple, 20% off on shoes, right? And then I have a 30% off on shoes. That little difference is basically going to tell you what is the, the value of that 10% change in price. That is basically a randomized control trial, which is the foundation of causal inference. So anytime companies do these A-B tests or they have some sort of policy change where maybe some part of their business is affected and others aren't, those are all foundational ways that a business is starting to understand why are things happening so then they can calibrate off of that rather than just, I sent an email out and then this is what happened, so now I'm going to try to predict what happened. The problem there is unless you're doing some sort of randomization, your results are more than likely going to be biased and you're going to be not accurately predicting kind of the outcome. Think of the classic targeting problem that a firm has. I have one customer group that is not very engaged with me, so I give them a really good deal. And then I have another customer group that is like my loyal customer, so maybe I don't give them quite as good of a deal. I give them a pretty good one. And then I look and see what are the results there. Since I didn't randomize, I basically had some sort of targeting rule. I may see that the worst deal, which was given to my best customers, is performing better than the really good deal that was given to my worst customers. Well, the problem there is you're looking at two different customers. So I think now the companies, especially in the online space, are adopting this A-B test or this more kind of scientific method, methodology behind what they're doing. They're basically looking at things like causal inference. They're just not calling it causal inference. Yeah, that makes sense. I do a lot of that kind of testing in my work. And you're right. It's the most valuable sort of testing to run. And it tells you, it tells you what you're doing right. And that's really important because then you know what to double down on. Yep. But it's tough, right? Firms don't always have the luxury of doing many A-B tests. So I think a lot of where the work is being done now, or at least the gap between what we've done in academic literature for a long time and what's being done in practice in firms is starting to say, what if you didn't run a randomized control trial or an A-B test or whatever you want to call it? Can we still get insights into how well did it work? 
and that requires a little bit more econometrics or machine learning or what have you. But at that point, you can start doing some really cool things. That's yeah, that's interesting. I I wanted to ask um, by the way, where what do you do? You have any books that you recommend or any sources of knowledge? Any anything that you follow to stay up to date on marketing? <laughs> So I'm trying to learn a lot more about generative AI because I'm not a social media person. And I think generative AI kind of has a social media flavor behind it because it's internet based. And so I follow someone named Ethan Mollick. He's from Wharton. He seems to be out in the forefront of all generative AI things and their applications across a variety of, of places. So I really like that. Uh, I think he does a great job. As far as causal inference goes, there's a professor named Scott Cunningham. He's, I believe he's at Baylor. He does a lot of great lectures on causal inference that I think are applicable to everybody. And so I like seeing what he does because he can take some very tricky, complicated topics and distill them down. And he also seems to be a font of just knowledge as far as new methods that are coming out all the time and how people are updating them. So those would be the two that I follow the most. That's where I get... Most of my information is I, I look to see what they're doing and then I read the papers that they're linking or see what they're doing. And that's been really helpful to stay ahead of the curve. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, this has been such a great conversation, James. I, I want to thank you again for um, explaining all of your work and um, having this conversation both at a societal level and then also diving into business applications. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This has been an absolute pleasure. I've, I've had a great time. Awesome. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for listening. We'll talk to you soon.